Hope for Anxiety and OCD, episode 27. This episode is going to be a little bit different because it's not a solo episode and it's not exactly an interview episode. It's really a compilation of some different stories of hope, some that we've heard before and some that we haven't yet. For those who have been following along with my story or listened to our first episode, know that while I have a history of being a foster parent and had hoped to adopt, I myself am not a mother. As I started to do these podcast interviews, there was a string of a period of time where we were getting a lot of stories about people's process in terms of becoming a family, whether that was praying and then having a biological child, whether that was adding to their family through adoption or other means. There was a lot of discussion about timing. And it really got me to thinking, God, are those stories for me or are those stories for my listeners? As so many times, I believe it's both, that as we minister to other people, that God finds a way to turn around and minister back to us. In this episode, I want to send love to the other women out there who maybe are waiting or praying or hoping for a family who are not yet mothers. So I compiled some stories of hope from different women that have been on the podcast and discussed this journey And I also compiled some stories from just other women in my personal life who I know, who God brought them on that similar journey. Before we get into those stories of hope, though, there are two moms that I do want to take time to say thank you to. One of those is my mom, who's a big supporter of the podcast. I know that she listens every week. She looks for the episodes to come out, and she'll send me emails if she sees Christian articles or hears of people who are talking about mental health, and she'll say, hey, have you heard of this person? You know, it might be somebody that's good for you to interview. My mom was flying a couple weeks ago. She asked a woman on the plane, hey, do you listen to podcasts? And a woman said, yes, I do. So Then my mom says, hey, would you be interested in a podcast about anxiety and OCD? The woman says, yes, I would. My mom gives her uh, a little podcast promo card that I had made up. That's some amazing grassroots marketing right there. And so thank you, mom, for all of your love and support in this uh, podcasting journey And the other mom I want to thank is who I call Mom Bach, which is my mother-in-law. Mom Bach is also a supporter of the podcast, and she listens to the episodes. And oftentimes, God will put people on her heart who need that encouragement or support from a particular episode, and she will send it to them and receive has received some positive feedback about episodes that she's shared. So I appreciate uh, her supporting and sharing the podcast with other people as well. I joke with Steve that our moms are brand ambassadors for the show, and now you know why. Our first story of hope for the not-yet-mothers comes from my best friend, Kristen. How did I become a mother? That's a loaded question. Hi, my name is Kristen Jasmine Wilson, And this is my story to motherhood. I am 39 years old. And this is important because maybe like some of you, I wasn't sure I would ever become a mother. I can remember from the earliest time, always loving being around kids, around babies. I grew up babysitting, starting at a very young age, probably too young if you ask me, Um, but I started babysitting as early as 11 for my next door neighbor. She had two beautiful kids that I used to watch on occasion. And I can even remember conning my mother into serving with me at the nursery during the second service at church, just because I loved kids that much. You can say that this might be a God-given desire. I would say that 
I had this idea in my mind that I would always be a mom, but in my mind, by age 25, I was to have, you know, met my, the love of my life in college, fallen madly, deeply in love, become a psychologist. I even found a letter that I wrote to myself in high school. I wanted to become a psychologist and have three kids of my own by 2011 or something crazy like that. However, (laughs) you know, sometimes life just takes you on a journey and that's not necessarily how things go. For me, I went to high school and had two boyfriends maybe, and all of which lasted two weeks. Um, And my singleness was a really, really hard thing. I struggled being single for a very long time. I went to college while I was in college, decided to get involved in the church that was right across the street from our school. I, again, loved kids so much that I started volunteering as a college student in the middle school ministry. Yes, working with middle schoolers, I know I'm a rare breed, um, but loved the naivety and the gullibility and just the welcoming nature of that age. In working in the middle school ministry, though, remember, college. So always thought I would meet the love of my life in college, never did. And in fact, after college, started working for a ministry and for a nonprofit that really just worked with middle school kids, all the while knowing that I wanted kids of my own, all the while really wanting to be married and not ever wanting to have kids without a partner in life. I I know I have had a lot of friends that have adopted or wanted to foster and have done that single handedly and by themselves. And my hat goes off to them. However, I knew for me, this was not a journey. I wanted to enter alone. Just knowing my own personality, I knew I would need a partner and a friend. And so I prayed to God many a night that he would bring me not only a man of God, but somebody who I could have children with and that we could raise children together. And I will say that that came, but it came not without tears and not without many, many years of doubting God, of asking hard questions, of crying out to the Lord, of yet one more guy who I was attracted to and had feelings for, not return those feelings, not return that love. I can remember during my college and a little after, I um, spent some years during those college times in West Palm Beach in one of my places that I would really kind of have heart-to-heart conversations with Jesus was on the beach. And I can remember there was this one guy, um, and I really just had fallen head over heels in love with him, and he had no clue and I was good friends with this sister, and I knew she she could tell, but I just remember, like, really asking the Lord, why? Just why? Why? I just remember asking, am I oblivious to guys? What What is it that allowed me to not be seen by guys? And really, I look back now, and I see that had those guys looked at me and seen me, I would have fallen head over heels with the wrong guy. And really, uh, my heart is so honestly flippant, and I fall in love with the the drop of a hat. So it's only the Lord's grace and mercy that has allowed me, that really kept me for my husband of today. Um, So again, college thought I would be married by 25. That was my, my cutoff date in my head. That did not happen. In fact, I remember at 25, I actually freaked out and was like, oh my gosh, I remember my mom had me at 25 and I sh- I'm really like far behind the timeline here because I wanted to have kids and I thought by that time I would have them. However, that was not what was in the cards for me. And in fact, it took me a long time to even work through what it looked like to actually be in a relationship and what it looked like to actually start to date, which then led to the motherhood. Um, All the while, though, working with kids, all the while, though, taking care of other people's kids, all the while knowing 
that I wanted to be a mother. I remember turning 30 and still being single. And I remember actually 29 going, I'm almost 30 the whole year and grieving that, that year of turning, of being single and turning 30. And I almost wished that whole year of 30 away. I think it was 32 or 33. When I was 32 or 33, I I finally was like, if I ever want to have kids, um, then I need to actually seriously start dating, started dating some guys on, um, through a few apps. Um, And at first had really a hard time even wrapping my mind around if that was acceptable, how what I believe. And so again, just really challenged my own thinking, but kind of came to the conclusion that if I was ever going to get married, I needed to be around guys and talk to them and have conversations. And so I went on a journey of just having dates and chronicling all of those dates. Um, some were really fun and some were really, really bad. And I could probably tell you stories, but I don't want to embarrass um, any of the guys that I went on on dates with. But let's just say there's a few that really still have me kind of chuckling today. Fast forward to 2016, I was talking to a guy who happened to live in California and actually had a daughter. And I knew that was going to be a little tricky, but I had been laid off. The organization I was working for, um, it closed down and I didn't have anything keeping me at my current location. So I decided to move to California and see if things would work out. And I honestly remember really just sacrificing a lot of my ethics and a lot of my morals for something that was only temporary and something that wasn't real and something, and for somebody that wasn't authentic. And I really think in some of those, in, in that particular instance, I had really become so sick of being single and just try, was trying to do things my own way and in my own timing. Honestly, at 35, I was feeling like I was the only 35-year-old woman who had never been married. I was feeling I was the only 35-year-old woman who didn't have kids. By this time, I had high school friends that had babies. I've had college friends get married and have babies. I had friends adopting babies. And I just, for a long time, felt like my life was on this pause track where I just had no control. And so many people kept saying, well, why aren't you married? Or you're a catch. Why are you still single? When are you going to start having babies of your own? And I, I really hated those questions because I felt like it was my own fault that I was unable to be a mother at that time. So at 35, I got in this relationship and I just decided to, to try to make things happen of my own accord and was completely devastated when this guy really only wanted to use me for certain things and then spit me back out. So with that, I packed up my bags and I moved back to my home in Chicago and kind of warded off dating for a while, actually. It was like, I'm done. This guy is stupid and Really, my heart was broken into a million pieces, and it was really partially my own fault for giving it to him without putting up boundaries to really safeguard my own heart. And of course, during that time, my relationship with the Lord was non-existent because at that point, I felt like I didn't trust him, and I was angry, and I didn't want anything to do with a God that didn't love me enough to give me a husband and children by the time I was 35, knowing that most women go through menopause and are unable to bear children in their 40s. So yeah, that was hard. Sometimes it, um, the life that I've, I've lived is great. I've gotten to do so many things as a single woman. I've gotten to explore and gotten to travel and have had so many different experiences that I would not have had if I had been married and kid and had kids, maybe I would have, I don't know. But at that point, I was just done with 
being a good girl and following the rules and thinking that, you know, God blesses you and, you know, honors you if you X, Y, Z. I think if I were to put it into different words, I was trying to make myself follow this God in order to get the blessing. And so in other words, it wasn't really about knowing God or trusting Him. It was about, I'm going to do this, so in the end I get this. And uh, ultimately that didn't work. Um, So I, for a small little time, I said I'm not dating anyone else. Um, At the time I did have a dating coach um, just because I was like, if I'm going to be dating and dating on an app, I'm going to need some extra advice. I was actually visiting her at the time and staying with her that weekend. And this guy popped up on my app. And I was super weary and super kind of not even sure I wanted to talk to him. She encouraged me. I showed him, he showed him, showed her like our conversation and, and she encouraged me just to start, start a conversation. And so we did. And he was actually from Chicago. I was already planning to move back there after having my heart broken, wasn't about to stay in California. And from there, fell in love, met my husband, my current husband. We dated, that was in 2017. We dated for a couple of years, got engaged February 22nd, 2019. We're married by June 22nd, 2019. And um, I have also had a lot of friends that have gotten late, married later on in life as well. So I've had a lot of, of friends but like some of the ones that have gotten married like late in their late thirties, they really struggled with infertility and struggled with having babies. And I was not even sure that I would be able to conceive right away and without some sort of help. And so we decided that when we got married and went on our honeymoon, we would not prevent, but not also not like put a lot of pressure and not try. And lo and behold, we I got pregnant within the first couple months without even trying. And I remember, I remember laying in bed after finding out and after like looking at the pregnancy test and really coming to terms with it and just hearing the song in Christ alone play through my head as like my song of coming really back to Christ and back to, to relationship with, with Jesus, like that was what had sealed and kind of redeemed and, you know, kind of brought me back and brought forgiveness to who God was. I think I was slowly coming back there with just the introduction of of meeting my husband. And there's a lot of emotions and, and hurt that had happened because of my own decisions and my own choices. But I think with my becoming pregnant, that was my aha moment. It's been a journey too. I'll tell you that becoming a mom, especially at this age was not easy. (laughs) At 38, when I got pregnant with him, 38, it was uh, probably a lot harder than most people. I don't know. I can't say I was never married at 25, but I did have a cousin who got pregnant around the same time and she was in her twenties. And there's a drastic difference of energy between 20-year-old mom, soon-to-be mom, and and an almost 40-year-old soon-to-be mom. But the gratefulness and the humbleness and the humility that I feel like the Lord offered actually allowed us to name our son Ellis Jason, which just means the kindness of God. Ellis means kindness. And I just really felt the Lord was kind in allowing me, after all these years of struggling, of wanting to become a mom, And just to have his kindness and giving us a son is truly a gift. So if you were like me, maybe you have dreams of becoming a mom and having children. I would say it's not too late. I would say that the Lord is good. He is kind. He gives life and and brings us through things that only teach us lessons to then share and bring hope to others that might be in those same situations. We are not without hope. We are not without life. 
It was really sweet to have Kristen share because I've seen her through this whole journey and the spiritual growth process that she's been on. I know her story is going to be encouraging for those of you maybe who are still single or have been through a long period of singleness. Summer McKinney's story from episode 15 also ties in with the same theme of waiting to be married. I I have to look at my own marriage. Hmm. Um, I was single until, you know, 28, got married at 29, came from a very large family and always wanted many children. And of course, the older I got, I mean, I could do the math in my head. Okay, Lord, you know, this isn't... Mm -hmm. Been like it's going to happen. Of course, that was before, like, you know, people in their 40s started having kids and stuff, you know, but it was like, okay, wait, my, my large family isn't going to happen. But, you know, God was in the details of my husband and I knew each other from, from way back when, but just went, you know, our own separate ways or, and whatnot. Um, but we reconnected and, you know, I inherited three amazing children in, in our marriage. And I had always wanted, my, my deal breaker was I, I wanted a child. And so if my husband and I were going to get married, you know, he would have to agree that we could have a child together. And he said, okay. So again, just, okay, Lord, I have three children and, and I want that camaraderie. I want them to grow up with a, you know, a younger sibling. Um, and so my timing was shortly after, you know, let's settle in to, to married life and blended family life. But a few years were going by and it's like, okay, Lord, is this going to happen? You know, just a lot of just questions. Right. You know? And my husband kind of gave up like, okay, she's not going to happen. Um, and it took us a few years. Um, God knew again, being in the details and mm. it was the perfect timing, the bonding that I was worried about. The boys were in high school whenever we had our son and uh, through college, one of the boys stayed home um, and commuted and the, the, the bonding is just amazing. And it was just all of those fears and all of those concerns or those questions. And just, it wasn't my timing, but, but the timing was just perfect. Right. Um, you know, it wasn't always my way, but it was, you know, God, God knew what he was doing and just being in the details. And so that, that to me was just the, the hope of, of a large family, the hope of, you know, the bonding and, and that unity among the family and, and God just blessed it. And so, you know, when, when those doubts or when fears or, you know, things come into play, whether you're single or whether you're in an empty marriage, you know, or divorced and you still have that desire. I think that, you know, God is in the details and his timing is amazing. It's not always our time. Right. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's kind of when I think about big thing in my life where desire and, and hope and blessing come together. I would say it's, it's definitely my family unit. Yeah. It's amazing how God will give us those desires. Like for you, it was for to have a large family and God totally filled that in a way that you couldn't have imagined at that point in time. Like you were thinking that all of those children would be, you know, completely biologically yours and you ended up with a beautiful family picture and it's you know yeah. it's amazing how god's dreams are much better than things that we could dream on our own and when we try to do it you know our ways or in our timing it just never quite quite shakes out and we can become disappointed while summer's story didn't look how she had envisioned holly girth's story from episode 19 didn't turn out how she anticipated either my story of hope is my family story. I went through about a decade of infertility. My husband and I couldn't have our own kiddos. And so we ended up adopting a 20 year old. Wow. <laughs> Who basically aged out of the foster system. And so she's now 27. And so she got married, and we are Nana and Poppy to Eula and Clement. And so I literally wore a ring on my finger that said hope for all those years. And the ending to our story is not at all what I would have imagined. Our last few stories are stories about infertility. On episode 16, Dr. Irene Cagle shared about her pregnancy losses. 
there were years, uh, for example, where I had multiple pregnancy losses. I write about this in my book as well, too, and not really knowing how that would resolve. And God brought us a child, and we have this beautiful nine-year-old boy that we love. And that's, that's something that brings me hope. The next story is from a dear friend of mine that I have known since about 2014. Hi, guys. My name is Michelle. I'm here with you today to share my testimony as well as my infertility, foster care, and adoption journey. So I was married and divorced at a young age to my first husband. We did not have children together, and that was not something we had really tried to do. But when I met what would eventually be my second husband, um, I knew that I did want to have children. We were a little bit older when we got married, my second husband and I. I was 35. And so immediately after we got married, we did start trying to have our own our own child. Unfortunately, that was not happening for us. So we went to a fertility doctor. And over the course of, I'd say, about a three-year span, we had approximately nine procedures done and close to $12,000 spent. But that did not bear any fruit. At the end of that three years, I think we were both emotionally, I was physically spent and both somewhat spiritually spent as well. Because we both prayed and prayed over this journey and really, you know, desperately wanted to have our own child. And at that time, we could not understand why the Lord was not providing that for us. The way I was looking at it is there's so many people that have children that don't even want them. Uh, But God, why? Are you not providing us with a baby of our own? And it made me feel unworthy of having a child. The way I was looking at it is, God, if if you could let this person who is abusive to their child or neglectful uh, or abandons their child, if you can let them have one, what does that say about me? What does that say about the parenting you think that I would do, God? And I really went into a deep, dark depression at the end of that three years. I began to resent my husband because I felt that I was the only one going through the emotional struggle, the physical, especially the physical struggle, because these all these procedures were happening to me, and some of them were very painful. And I felt like he was doing a small fraction of the work. And over time, through scripture and prayer, I did grow to see that that was very unfair of me to to think that way. But I'm human, and I felt um, that I was had been abandoned by the Lord uh, during that period of time. I was also very resentful of other women who, during this phase, were discovering they were pregnant and having healthy pregnancies, and having these beautiful children. And what makes it probably even worse is uh, my career was in early childhood education. So my career was children, and especially babies and toddlers and those early stages of life. That was my career. So day in and day out, I was seeing and working with these babies and um It really brought me to a low place. So my husband and I eventually decided that we would go through the foster care program, through the PATH classes. But I told him that he would have to do all the legwork of getting us set up for the classes, that basically he would just tell me the time and place and I would just show up. And so that's what he did. We went through the PATH classes and through those classes, I met other women who were in a very similar situation, who felt almost identical to how I felt. They felt 
worthless and useless. And um, the way I felt during that period of time, during that dark period, is that I basically had one job to do. Uh, The Lord made me a female, which meant I was supposed to have children. And I couldn't do the one job that the that God had given me to do. And I, I just felt just so inadequate and so useless that some days I didn't want to get out of bed. Luckily, through prayer, through scripture, through family and friends who rallied around me, around us, my husband and I both, and supported us, and a God who never, never gives up. He never fails us. I began seeing how, even though those were the things that I wanted, I wanted to have my own child, my own biological child. I wanted to know the joys of being able to tell family and friends that we were expecting a child, to feel a life growing inside of me, and seeing this beautiful baby when it was first born and caressing them against my chest, having all those moments through time and through prayer, uh, God very gently showed me that he had a different plan for me. Even though I kept questioning God, what is this? What, What plan is this you have for me? I don't understand. I don't see it yet, God. He was just really patient with me and to show me that I need to stay the course. So we finished the PATH classes. We sold our small house and bought a bigger house so that we could accommodate children. And we knew we probably wanted to have multiple. So we got our, back in, um, it was uh, 2015, we got our first sibling set. It was a brother and a sister. And we actually got them on my daughter, what is now my daughter's sixth birthday, and my son, uh, Larry, he was seven, about to turn eight. So it was, we went from zero to 60 in 2.8 seconds. We had no kids, and then we had two kids, and it was the youngest child's sixth birthday. So we scrambled to throw get, throw together a little party, and our lives changed from that day like we could have never imagined. Um, We have been blessed beyond measure. Even in the rough times, we have been blessed because the Lord has stretched us. He has grown us. My husband and I have grown closer together. Uh, We have grown closer to the Lord. And God revealed to me pretty quickly into the foster care process that his plan for us was to adopt children who needed a family. It took us three and a half years to be able to legally adopt our children. Then finally on January 30th, 2019, we were able to legally adopt Kimberly and Larry. Now our journey has not always been an easy one. There's been days where I have wanted to pull my hair out, <clears throat> pardon me, and say, God, <laughs> what have I done? And then immediately I'm filled with all the love and joy that the Lord has put into our heart when he brought us these kids. They are amazing. And we knew pretty instantly that we were meant to be their parents. Uh, that these kids were going to be with us forever. And it has been such a journey and such a blessing. And uh, my husband and I both feel that the, we just stayed the course with the Lord. He He's always sovereign. He's always faithful to us. He never leaves us. He's, he never abandons us. He shows us what, a, what we need eventually in his time and not our own. So I just hope this fills you with some peace and some hope and knowing you are not alone if you've been in a similar situation and that God does have a plan for you. You may not see it at this moment, but he will reveal it to you. 
just be faithful. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. And I just wish blessings upon you. God bless you all. I really appreciated the vulnerability and the spiritual wrestling that Michelle shared in her story because I believe that someone who's listening is really going to be able to relate to those thoughts and questionings that she had and wrestled with with God. On episode 22, Lindsay Castleman shared her amazing story of adoption with us. During this time and being in this community group, we found out, uh, my husband and I, we found out that we were not able to have children. And then there were, there were six couples, four out of the six couples found out that they could not have children. Wow. Which was crazy. And, it, and didn't know it before we became, like, it, we weren't like, hey, let's do an infertility community group. It just like, it just happened. And then we all discovered these things. Hopefully it wasn't something we all drank, you know, but so we were in this together. Well, we started to go through this adoption process for us, my husband and I. And one day, one of the girls in the community group texted me and she was like, Lindsay, my mom is in a Bible study with this woman who's asking the whole Bible study to pray for an adoptive family for her like nephew son. Like it's kind of a big old, whoa, like <laughs> weird thing. Six degrees of separation. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And she was like, my mom remembered you guys in community group and da, 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 da. like, would you be interested? And I'm like, what? Now it was kind of wild because I was actually at this church that was like, when I got the text message, I was literally in church and they were about to do this worship and they do this forever long worship. So I'm like, all right, so I'm doing, I'm worshiping. And I'm asking God, I'm like, God, is this our son? Like, is this what we're supposed to do? And I heard a very clear yes. And I don't hear that kind of stuff all the time. So I heard a very clear yes. And so I said, all right, God, well, you're going to have to tell my husband that you said yes. <laughs> because <laughs> because um, he's, he's a little bit more of my risk averse kind of guy. I'm a little bit more of the risk taker. So anyways, I called my husband because I was on a trip. So we, he was back at home and I was in California. And um, I called my husband and I said, hey, the girl in our community group said, da, 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 what do you think? And he was like, I'm open. And I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> all right. Like, that's not usually the response I get. I usually get all the worry questions. And if you're in the Enneagram world, he's an Enneagram six. So that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so... Uh, like kind of to make a long story short, even though I've already made it long, is we ended up like meeting with that family. And then on a Tuesday, they told us that they chose us. And then we brought our son home that Saturday. So it was like, we kind of look back and we go, oh my goodness. Like even just us being kind of like obedient to want to serve you know, and not obedient and like ooh, begrudging, but just like, hey, we really would like to serve. Just how God placed us with all of these people that then placed us with our son who could not have been a better fit. And if I go into the emotion of it, I will cry right now, but I'm not going to stay in my head about Aww. it. You know? <laughs> but just in that sense of like, we couldn't imagine our, our lives without him, you know? And so in this place, of feeling so hopeless and infertility, right? Like God was already working behind the scenes and bringing us hope just through these things we could have never orchestrated for us to be able to be parents to our son. So that for us is like, anytime it's like, oh, is God, is God working? I'm like, heck yeah, he is. You know? <laughs> <laughs> He is, and but and working today, like working today, you mm -hmm. know, not just in biblical times, like he's working today, and he is a God of hope, and he is a relational God that loves us and wants to be so close to us, right? And that's that's beautiful in that way. I started out this episode by talking with you about how I am not yet a mother either. I wanted to share with you where I am on my own personal journey 
in case that provides any extra support or encouragement to you. Steve and I pray about having a family. We're very open to what does that look like for us since we are older. The most amazing thing, though, is that one of the times I was praying about this, I feel like the Lord spoke to me, Carrie, I've already given you many children. I have to say, I didn't receive that in a sense of God's not going to give me children. However, it made me actually so grateful and thankful because that statement is true. I was looking back at some old pictures that I had under the bed, you know, before we were in the digital era. So they're actual physical pictures that I have from times where I did VBS with children, times where I worked at an after-school program with children in the inner city, times where I was involved in helping with youth ministry and, and middle school ministry. Many of those kids obviously are not kids anymore. They're grown up, and some of them have children of their own. But when I received that word to my spirit in prayer, it gave me so much joy and encouragement that I've worked with children almost my whole life in some capacity. I know that God has used me to minister to the next generation even though that may not look like having children in a a nuclear family. So if that's you, if you're that person that's maybe single and serving in the children's ministry at church, or you're in college working at the after-school program and investing in kids, know that even though they're not your kids, they're God's kids. And you are providing just a valuable service by loving on them, encouraging them, supporting them in their growth journey process, physically, emotionally, spiritually, whatever that looks like for you. Sometimes Mother's Day can be a hard day or an emotional day for women who aren't mothers. I've had people tell me that they don't attend church on Mother's Day due to this. If that's you and you're hurting on that day, I would encourage you to find something that you do enjoy doing and plan to do it on that day. Definitely take good care of yourself and you know what you can handle emotionally. Whatever your journey is, whether you're a mother, whether you're not a mother, whether you're not a mother yet, know that God loves you very much, that he has an amazing plan for your life And things never work out exactly how we plan them out in our minds. However, we know that God is good. We know that God is loving. We know that God is pro-family. And whatever that looks like for you, I just pray that this podcast encourages you in your journey wherever you are right now. Some of you may have listened to this episode because you're in this season. For those of you who listen to this episode and you're not in this season, maybe you already have children and you're just a regular listener to the podcast, there's a good chance that God has put someone in your circle who is either struggling with fertility or questioning how can they be single for so long and have children, or they can relate to some of these other stories. Will you please just share this episode and allow it to be a vehicle of encouragement to the people that you know who may need to hear this? And if this episode has impacted you positively, please let me know. You can always reach out at www.hopeforanxietyandocd.com. Head on over to the contact page. As always, thank you so much for listening. Hope for Anxiety and OCD is a production of By the Well Counseling in Smyrna, Tennessee. Our original music is by Brandon Mangrum, and audio editing was completed by Benjamin Bynum. Until next time, may you be comforted by God's great love for you.